It's Monday, it's 12.15 and we're live here in Manchester for the Conservative Party Conference. Joining me, political editor of The Sun, Harry Cole, and The Guardian, North of England, editor, Helen Pidd. Today, Chancellor Rishi Sunak is delivering his speech to party conference. Pragmatism, fiscal responsibility, a belief in work, and an unshakable optimism about the future. This is who I am. Should Conservatives worry about more tax rises from this Chancellor? Farmers warn of a pig cull because of butcher shortages. Boris Johnson says uncontrolled immigration isn't the answer. The way forward for our country is not to uh, just pull the big lever marked uncontrolled uh, immigration. A prominent Tory donor is involved in one of Europe's biggest corruption scandals. And the EU relations minister says this. The long bad dream of our EU membership is over and the British Renaissance has begun. Welcome to all of you watching today. First in-person conference since the election for the Conservatives. Harry, what's the atmosphere actually like? It's not very triumphalist, certainly. It's not triumphalist. There's obviously a lot going on back in, you know, in the real world. The fuel crisis sort of looms quite heavily over it. Mm. I dare I say it's a little bit flat, but I think party managers and, and number 10 won't mind that too much. They just want to get through this without any major disruption here. Well, underlining that, let's just show you um, this, Helen, for you to comment on. This is a tweet from Paul War at the Eye. He is actually talking about the size of the auditorium and saying it's actually quite small in Manchester for Tory conference. And the first thing to note is just how small the auditorium is. They've shrunk the normal space significantly. What does that tell you? Yeah, it's odd, isn't it? It's either they didn't think many people were going to turn up. Well, I guess that's, that's, the, only, that's the only explanation I can have for it, but it's so odd. This is probably the only place at party conference where people are actually socially distanced because the effect <laughs> is Rishi Sunak is speaking as we're on air right now and it is, it's absolutely cheek to jowl in there. Cheek by jowl. Is it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's absolutely chocolate. I don't know why they've made it so small. It's weird. We'll have a word with them afterwards. Yeah. We'll I check on maybe, this. I think maybe they were, when, you know, these things take months and months of organisation and back when, mm. you know, back when they were sort of hiring, literally hiring the stage, maybe they did think it was going to be small they wouldn't be able to have this gathering. However, um, at the back, of the, back, at the, back of, the, of the auditorium, there's an even bigger stage where one Boris Johnson will be allowed to give a speech, but it's just his cabinet that have to give it <laughs> these little tiny short speeches to a tiny room, almost like he doesn't want to be upstaged. Oh, well, you would possibly <laughs> say that, would you, Harry? I mean, we can hear the cheers there for yeah. Rishi Sunak. I mean, he is a big draw. Yes. It's quite interesting that over the last few days, he and the Prime Minister, and no doubt others, will be continuing to make this argument that what they're going for is this high-wage economy. But, I mean, is that a credible argument? I think it is. I do have a think that perhaps they could have been making this argument before the, the shelves emptied and the forecourts erupted into fistfights. If that had been a sort of narrative that had been sort of sown all the way through the last few months and years, then yes. It feels to me a little bit like they have grabbed this as a slight excuse for the chaos, but they're really sticking to their guns on this. And actually, the argument that if you, if you, you know, the argument that Labour have to make essentially is that if you open the doors to more EU visas and more people coming into this country, you are essentially arguing against a pay rise for Brits. Whether that is, you know, whether they can stay on the right side side of sounding uncallous while making that argument remains to be seen. Because at the moment, they are straying slightly into a, it's a, it's hurting because it's working. And I think that could, could put off some sort of more sort of moderate, sensible voters. Right. Well, the short-term pain that I think Harry is talking uh, about and alluding to, when you look outside the conference hall and you see protesters, uh, protesters on the streets about the cost of living issues, about rising prices, how does that argument stack up? Well, I, th I think it's a very difficult one for them to make, and I think that it's a risky argument for the Tories to run. They just seem to have really zeroed in on something that Keir Starmer said last week about inviting HGV drivers sort of from, from overseas, and the Tories have, have seen an opportunity to kind of capitalise on that. 
But I think if you're outside in the real world and you're one of the 3.5 million people whose um, fuel bills are going to go up this winter, if you haven't been able to fill up your car in the south or the southeast over the past week, I think it all sounds pretty hollow. Right. I mean, if we just show you this headline in the, in the mirror, Boris Johnson not responsible for what's in the shops, claims the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss. Is that a credible argument, that it's not anything to do with the government? I don't think it's... Any, I think there is an element of a, a sort of government that's slightly at the end of its tether with big business. They see a lot of these issues uh, as part of a sort of longer game that being played by big business to lobby, essentially, to water down the freedom of movement reforms, to you know, sort of eke out exemptions across sectors. And there's a lot of anger aimed uh, at the fuel industry and the uh, haulage industry, who uh, they, the government actually blame privately very heavily for the, the fuel shortages. Essentially a lobbying, a lobbying game that's got way out of hand, literally playing with matches. Um, and whether or not you know, the public will side from that, you know, you know, the, the, the sort of Brexit coalition that elected Boris Johnson is, remains strong if you look at the polls. But how long is that going to mm. be able to weather when you can't get to work because you can't fill up your car and, you know, heaven forbid, you're not going to be able to get a turkey this Christmas? Well, I wondered if you might mention Christmas. I can't believe we're already talking about it. But, you know, that will be uh, an issue in people's minds. You know, will the shelves be empty, some of them, by then? Yeah, Still. yeah, for sure. And right now it's the most visible sign that something's gone wrong. You go to the shops. You know, there's been times I've gone to the shops and I haven't even, even been able to to get some milk like these are pretty basic. basic yeah basic things that have gone wrong but yet here at Tory party conference it's not it's not what people are talking about in yep. the fringe events uh, Rishi Sunak I don't think he's mentioned the fuel crisis once or uh, it's like la 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 everything's brilliant in Tory party <laughs> weirdly land. it was the same last week with Labour they went into this sort of intense navel gazing bubble yeah. and it took until the day four I think for Keir Starmer to mention the fuel crisis on the stage of his speech and you think, hang on, there's a complete disconnect between the bubble here and what, what is going yeah. on outside. And that is, that's dangerous for any political party. Mm. It's particularly dangerous for the government. And I wonder whether, in his big speech on Wednesday, whether the PM might slightly address, needs to address some of these sort of, you know, reality-based issues. Yeah. All right, Harry, thank you very much. We will let you go and mill about the auditorium. <laughs> um, let's listen to part of Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor's speech. There can be no prosperous future unless it is built on the foundation of strong public finances. I have to be blunt with you. Our recovery comes with a cost. Our national debt is almost 100% of GDP, so we need to fix our public finances. Because strong public finances don't happen by accident. They are a deliberate choice. They are a legacy for future generations and a safeguard against future threats. I'm grateful. We should all be grateful to my predecessors and their 10 years of sound conservative management of our economy. They, they believed in fiscal responsibility I believe in fiscal responsibility, and everyone in this hall does too. And whilst I know tax rises are unpopular, some will even say unconservative, I'll tell you what is unconservative. Unfunded pledges, reckless borrowing and soaring debt. Anyone who tells you that you can borrow more today and tomorrow will simply sort itself out just doesn't care about the future. So yes, I want tax cuts, but in order to do that, our public finances must be put back on a sustainable footing. So Rishi Sunak there, the Chancellor, who's been delivering his keynote speech to party conference. We can welcome a member of his team. Longest serving? Yes. Well, well the done you. Do you get a badge for being the Economic Secretary to the Treasury, Just don't happy you? happy to carry on. <laughs> yeah, well, welcome here um, to our studio. He's been talking, amongst other things, about a high-wage economy, mm. as has the Prime Minister. Mm. 
it's not actually that clear a picture, is it, John? Would you accept that the large wage growth is actually distorted by the pandemic mm. in the first instance? And secondly, the Office for National Statistics has said that median wage growth over the last year has barely moved. And actually, when you factor in inflation, which is running at something like 3.2%, it's actually not even keeping pace. So it's not true, is it, to say that we are in a state of a high wage economy or that wages are rising? I think we've got to face up to the fact that we've gone through a pandemic where the government have put in a whole range of interventions to support the economy and to support jobs. And what the Chancellor's done in his speech today is reiterate his focus on helping people to stay in work, to get people back into work, and to put a range of interventions to support the economy as we continue to bounce back. But that's back. not the answer to my question. It's not true, is it, <clears> for ministers, including the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, to keep repeating this line <clears> that <throat> wages generally are rising because it is not the true picture. It is a complicated picture right. that actually, after a pandemic, there have been major distortions to the labour market. But what we have seen today in the Chancellor's speech is his commitment to support young people, people throughout their working lives, to gain the skills to maintain that level of growth. Another statistic I could give you is that we are predicted in this economy, mm. of the G7 economies, to grow faster than any other. Right. And that's because what, of the interventions that the Chancellor has made. But what level of growth is it that you're talking about? Because you've just admitted there are major distortions caused by the pandemic, mm. and the Office for National Statistics, very mm. well-respected institution, says that actually when you look at that median wage growth, it's barely moved. Mm. Should ministers stop talking about a high-wage economy? We don't have that yet. No, what we're doing is making the interventions that allow jobs to be created, allow businesses to grow and support people to gain the skills to sustain that growth in momentum. We've had several million people in this country on furlough. Mm. One in three young people on furlough. You don't go from ending that scheme uh, last week to having uh, the full outcome of this journey that we're on. Right, so we're not there yet. Well, we're not. We, we no. haven't reached the, the culmination of all our aspirations. No, we haven't. Right. All governments would have faced a similar situation with respect to uh, a pandemic, but this government took action. Right, and as yet, we don't know what the outcome will be. That's what you hope it will be, a high-wage economy. Because actually, the announcements that you've made for £500 million for people leaving the furlough scheme, mm. an extension of the Kickstarter scheme, mm. it sounds quite impressive, but when you put it alongside the millions of families losing a £20 a week increase mm. in universal credit, when you think ahead to the tax mm. rises that are going to come next April, the freezing of the income tax thresholds, mm. it doesn't really match the scale of what's going to be lost well, and I taken think, out of people's well, pockets. Well, I think the scale of 12% unemployment, where we're now less than 5%, mm. demonstrates the effectiveness of some of the interventions that we've taken. The Chancellor has also announced a few days ago a £500 recovery fund to support the poorest in our society. But when we made the interventions, we clearly had a, a range of interventions. Some of them were temporary. That the Chancellor's just announced in his speech are an extension of those measures to support uh, working people. Right, but wages aren't rising when they are because you've changed the economy yet, as you've accepted, they're rising because there are shortages in specific industries. There are shortages in specific industries and that's why we've taken some measures to support those individual sectors and we'll continue to work carefully with business representative organisations as we address that transition. Right, how long is it going to take? It's not going to happen overnight, is there? So there's going to be short-term pain, medium-term mm -hmm. pain. Well, obviously, it varies considerably sector by sector, but what we are doing is ensuring that we're giving employers the incentives to take on people, we're giving them practical support in terms of the skills agenda, and we're giving hope to a recovery that it will be enduring and will actually be competitive in a global context, because that's the lens we need to see this through. All right, you'll stay with us, John, uh, for a few more minutes, because we're going to go to our chief political correspondent, Adam Fleming. He's with Tony Danker from the CBI. Adam. Hi, Joe. Yeah, let's dive in and ask Tony what he thought. Um, so an extension of lots of the schemes that exist already, like the Kickstarter, does that meet the moment? Is that what business wants? Well, look, I think it was an enjoyable speech. And you're right, he did talk about job creation achieved during the pandemic, where the Chancellor did a great job and extending that is good news. And then he leaped sort of into the future, didn't he, and talked about a future British economy that's technologically inspired. And what's not to love about that? So I thought it was a good speech. 
Uh, and I think it's good that he focused on the job point. He's had a very good record during the crisis and he wants to extend that. Um, over the weekend, the Prime Minister accused British business of mainlining cheap, low-wage immigration, basically like being hooked on it like a drug. What would you say to that? Yeah, well, there was some talk about everybody wanting to pull the, uh, the uh, un unmitigated uh, immigration lever, which, to be honest, I really don't know a business that does believe in that. What the Prime Minister said, and I agree with him, is we want high wages, high skills, high productivity, high growth. I think the risk is that at the moment it's the wages that are going up, which is good news, but the rest aren't. And I think what the Chancellor said this morning was that we need to be careful of that. We need to be able to have the growth in the economy to afford the wages we want. And I think that's right. I hope we hear more about that from the Prime Minister and the Chancellor this week. Um, what could be some of the negative consequences of, of high wages, just on their own in isolation? Yeah, look, I think high wages, we know, and that's why everybody's watching it, leads to higher inflation, unless you can have high investment, high skills and high growth alongside them. The risk is if you only do the wages bit, and nobody's looking for the immigration system of the past, but if you only do the wages bit and you don't get the growth, you have an economy in some trouble. So I hope what we're going to hear from the Prime Minister on Wednesday, and certainly from the Chancellor in three weeks' time at the budget, is this plan for growth, this plan for investment, this plan for productivity, because then we can certainly afford to pay the higher wages everybody wants. Tony, thank you very much. And I suppose actually Rishi Sunak, Joe, was doing that speech with one hand tied behind his back because there's this huge double fiscal event of the budget and the spending review in three weeks' time. And that's when we'll get all the real detailed stuff. Well, as you say, that's where all the figures uh, will be. Thank you very much, Adam and Tony Danka there. John, listening to that, you heard from the CBI. Mm. But the Prime Minister said very clearly, and he blamed business, he said business have been mainlining low-wage immigration. Is he right? Well, clearly, there has been a transition from where we were... Yeah, but under have the... they been mainlining well, low-wage immigration? You, That's quite you, an accusation. You, you just heard Tony you, Danker say uh, he didn't know a business that does that. Well, I also, also heard Tony Danker welcome the Chancellor's remarks today, welcome his focus on jobs, and welcome the fact that his aspiration is for a highly productive economy with higher wages. Right. Have but they there been, isn't, there, they been mainlining low-wage immigration, There isn't a, a button to press to change the, the structure of the economy overnight. I think most of your viewers will understand that. How long will it take? Well, there's, I mean, sector by sector, there will be different patterns of investment. What we're trying to do as a government is set the framework for that investment, for that investment in high-skill, high-wage economy, which focuses on enhanced productivity. Right, what's, what are those sectors supposed to do in the meantime? Let's say it's a year. Let's say it's a year where there is this gap from mm. them, as the Prime Minister said, mainlining low-wage mm. um, immigration to the transition that you're talking about. Mm. What will those sectors do? Well, a number of those sectors will take advantage of some of the uh, initiatives that we've brought in to give some concessions, to allow some targeted workers More visas in. than to other sectors. Well, and we're also looking at high-skill visas and also looking at intercompany transfers to allow that to happen more uh, easily. Right. Um, so we don't yet know how long the transition will last. There mm. could be then more visas. Mm. Because do you accept that, actually, the main point is there is a huge difference between uncontrolled immigration mm. and what people are calling for here, which is increasing immigration at certain levels. That's mm. what Brexit was all about. Yes, the calibration of our, our immigration policy will be a conversation that we'll, we will have with industry in different sectors, looking at the level of skills that they need and applying those rules to those sectors. But what we can't have is a situation that I think people wanted us to move away from was a situation where there were no constraints on immigration. That is a clear distinction where we were, and I think most people would understand that was an outcome of the and Brexit And just, and uh, just to clarify, you will issue more visas then to other sectors? Over time, we will be able to short address Short-term temporary challenges. visas, not just the high-skilled ones, but short-term temporary visas we, to fill those we, shortages. We will be working with different sectors to support them through this transition. Helen, what do you make of what you've heard? Well, I just think it's quite bizarre that a government which always insisted, or the sort of the Brexiteer side of the government, that always insisted they weren't against immigration, they were just against uncontrolled immigration. Why not say, we've got this massive labour shortage, hooray! Now that we're out of the EU, we can do what we want in order to attract the labour. I, I just think it's really weird. Um, that, that you're kind of going out on an attack against immigration well, when... Not, not really. We're not attacking immigration. Mm. But what we are saying is that we need the calibration mm. of that immigration 
to be proportionate to our aspirations to have a highly productive, mm. high-wage economy. Mm. And making a single decision at one point yeah. to open the floodgates doesn't seem appropriate when what we've got to do is listen to different sectors. See, is it? It well, would just be being able to, to pull the... what you were implying no, it, it, was that somehow no. we should just open it up not... on day one, straight after we've you're had trying, the biggest... You're trying on me the what biggest... the Tories are trying on Keir Starmer. I'm not saying that at no. all. I thought the whole joy of being out of, out of the EU is that we get to control our own immigration system and we fill do. the gaps that we've got. We um, but that doesn't mean to say that on day one we open we're up not on day to one, numbers. Are we? Well, we we, we've just come out of the pandemic with yeah. several million people on furlough. The economy yeah. is clearly adjusting, and I think most most viewers will understand. Yeah, that. and your and your response is to cut twenty pounds a week from the most vulnerable people in this country Our tomorrow. Our response is to is just... we extended it for six months as a temporary measure, which it always was, mm. and we provided five hundred million pounds. Mm for the poorest families, for local authorities to support those families at this time of transition. That is a, res a response that actually takes account of the mm. fact that the economy is now opening up and we want more investment in jobs. A lot John of people Glenn. would just oh. see it as very cruel. I don't think so. John Glenn, thank you very much, Economic Secretary to the Treasury there. Now, we actually tried to test the temperature in a nearby seat in Altrincham, talking to voters and asked them if the government is doing a good job. Just bamboozle you with a load of shit, don't they? At the end of the day. <laughs> I'm Bojo fan as it goes. <laughs> I don't think you'd be able to broadcast it. They're ruining the country. I think they're doing very well. I think he's had a difficult time with what's been going on. So uh... it's, all right. it's all very well to criticise other parties, but could they do any better? <laughs> I'd like to have seen what these other numpties would have done like. Every time, they, every time they, they're interviewed and they ask what would you have done different, they never answer the question. Because yeah. they don't know. And that's it, simple as. My grandmother with five granddaughters and I really worry about their future. And I wouldn't be exaggerating to say that sometimes I think I'm really pleased that I'm not going to live that much longer to be out of it because I find it so angst-making, you know? When he says something, he says, I am going to get it done. But he doesn't get it done. It's all like lies to you. I find it very hard to agree with anything that this particular government say. I don't think they've got a clue. We're talking about public educated, largely white, middle class and beyond middle aged men who've got no idea how normal people lead their lives. Whoever would have been in charge have got a job to do and I think it's a, a horrendous job. And I think, overall, he's probably done the best he can. OK, well, there you go. Some voices from the streets of the Conservative seat of Altrincham. In the seat here now next to me is Jake Berry. He's chair of the Northern Research Group of Conservative MPs. Welcome to you. You listen there to a sort of mixture of voices, if you like. Not a lot of optimism. Um, you know, not a lot of people being upbeat about the government. Well, that's the challenge, isn't it, for this conference here? I mean, it's absolutely clear that there's no love for Labour there. It seems that Keir Starmer had one test. He's but you've got to hold on to these flat, voters. Flat on his face. But the challenge of this conference is to define what levelling up means. I think that's a big ask of the government at the moment. It's a bit of a catch-all phrase. And then also for people to be able to taste and touch levelling up in the community. Mm. Many of these red wall votes, they're just lent to us. And unless people can tangibly see change and quick, then we're going to you know, have a challenge ahead of us. And will it be helped by taking away the £20 a week um, temporary rise in universal credit and tax rises coming round the corner in the form of well, national insurance? I, I, will that help? You're, you're being a wag there, aren't you? Because I think you know that I have said that one of the questions mm. the government has to answer is how do you level up communities while taking money away well. from them? That's a challenge I put out there. I haven't heard an answer yet, but you, I, you know, there's a lot. I, Rishi Sunak has just spoken. I, yes. I haven't seen what he said. There's a lot more time for the government to answer that important challenge. Is there a lot more time? I mean, he's clearly sticking to those policies that he's announced. Oh, lively behind us. Um, sticking to those policies of higher tax rises coming round the corner, freezing those income tax thresholds. As you're quite right, you have spoken about these things. Uh, taking away universal credit. Is the government actually worried? about how voters will respond? 
Well, I, I don't think the government can know yet because a lot of these changes haven't taken place. I would suspect that they are quite worried about it. But I'm just an old-fashioned Tory, and I think one of the good ways of growing the economy, particularly here in the north of England, absolutely we need levelling up, we need that new government architecture to enable us to grow our economy. But growing the economy is key, and that's what I hope the government's going to focus on. Mm -hmm. Helen? Yeah, well, I just think that cutting universal credit right now is going to leave a lot of really vulnerable people in limbo. And we, there's, there's more than 300,000 people who are going to lose £20 a week tomorrow who are full-time carers for se severely disabled people. And I haven't seen anything from this conference or from the, from the government to, to suggest that they care about, about these people. And I think it is very difficult for them to claim that they're levelling up opportunity for everybody when the most vulnerable people are going to be left behind and worse off. So I think Helen's got a really good point. There. I think what we have to think about is, was this cost of living crisis predictable? In my view, mm. it was. I'm not an economist. I got a B mm. in my GCSEs, which probably isn't very good. <laughs> uh, was this predictable? It's not bad. No, well, yes, because if you pump loads of money into the economy, you, you know that that's going to push up the cost of living. So did the government have this cost of living in its mind when it did things like increase mm. corporation tax, increase national insurance, take away that universal credit? I simply don't know the answer to that. But if the answer is no, then maybe it's the time to think again because right. the Prime Minister spoke brilliantly yesterday about we want to increase people's wages in the economy. But if you have an economy where inflation is endemic as it is at the moment, it's everyone's wages who've got to increase to make up for that, not just some sectors like logistics and maybe the hospitality and care sector. Do you think they are misjudging the situation against the cost of living concerns that you and Helen have talked about? I mean, are you starting to lose faith in the government really putting its money where its mouth is when it comes to the voters that you are talking about? I mean, are they actually going to tilt resource away from parts of the country in order to invest in parts of the north of England, the Midlands? Well, when I speak to northern colleagues, and I work with colleagues across the north of England, Conservative MPs, they are massively enthused about Michael Gove being there in place. He is someone who will deliver, and I absolutely believe that he both gets and understands, but will also make things happen for levelling up. So let's see what is said at this conference, but I think that colleagues are absolutely backing the government, and so are voters. Those voters who voted Conservative for the first time, many of them across the Red Wall, they want to be right. They well, don't want to say, I did it and no. I was wrong. They want to be right. So they are backing the government and they're backing this programme and I think together we will deliver. Well, this won't come as good news to you. You may have seen this from Henry Zeffman in The Times, Helen. Uh, Boris Johnson's majority would be almost halved, he says in this tweet, if an election were held today. YouGov's first MRP, the major poll since the 2019 election, suggests. Poll of 50 Red Wall seats shows Tories losing 18 to Labour, with another 14 too close to call. Yeah, I, I don't find that tremendously surprising. I think during the pandemic, people were keeping the faith um, in the Conservative Party and a lot of people saying, well, how do we know Labour would have done any better? But I think that I think the patience is wearing thin now, now that people can see empty shelves at the supermarket, they can't fill up their car, those very basic things. Um, and also, if you look at sort of local elections from earlier in the year, Andy Burnham, we're in the kingdom of Andy Burnham here in Greater Manchester. Mm -hmm. He won every single ward, every single local authority, including quite a few red wall seats. I mean, maybe that's an Andy Burnham exceptionalism argument, but I do think the signs are there that, that the Red Wall is not holding up as the Tories might like. Is he someone to fear? Well, I, I mean, I don't think it's for us to worry about, but if I was Keir Starmer, <laughs> I'd be feeling a bit nervous. I was on Any Questions, another brilliant I know, BBC I heard it. And I asked Andy Burnham, will you have, um, you know, will you have uh, someone in your shadow cabinet? And he said, well, maybe. So I think he has that in his mind. It was Angela Rayner. But are you, uh, are you closer to their way of thinking when it comes to these sorts of issues in the government at the moment? Well, I think the challenge is that levelling up is a consensus issue. Mm. And that's really hard for the Labour Party. It's also quite hard for us as a political party. So we have to define how we're going to deliver levelling up. And let's be clear, the government will not deliver levelling up. It will be businesses and communities across mm. the north of England who will deliver it. So that is why it's so urgent that the government defines it. Because if we don't know the plan, how can we do it? And that's what I'm calling well, Michael that's your Gove challenge. the government to do. Well, that's your challenge. Come back on soon and well, tell us if it's been met, <laughs> Jake Berry. Yeah, you, you will, thank goodness for that. Um, we're going to get more reaction uh, to the Chancellor's speech, Rishi Sunak, um, and the government's overall economic strategy. We're going to speak to Andrew Neil. Remember him, formerly of this parish, more recently at GB News and as ever chairman of The Spectator. Andrew, good to see you. Good to see you, Joko. 
Now, the government has been making this argument and continues to do so, that lower levels of immigration, the lever of uncontrolled immigration, as the Prime Minister described it, will actually lead to higher wages. Is that a risky strategy? Uh, it, all strategies have risk. There's some risk in that. Wages are rising now. Average earnings are going up by about 4%. Of course, prices are rising pretty fast as well now. And the danger in the... There is no question wages need to rise. They've stagnated for 20 years. It's about time Labour had its day in the sun. That's Labour with a small L. And started seeing some real pay rises. Except the danger now is that wages are rising at a time when prices are rising fast. And so, therefore, you run the risk of a wage price spiral of wages chasing prices, and that results in inflation. That's the biggest danger, that the peaks in inflation that we'll see between now and the end of the year are not temporary, as the Bank of England says, but because of wage rises get baked in, and therefore inflation stays well above the bank's 2% target. That inflate, with all the implicate, that's the economic danger, the political danger is all the implications that has for the cost of living, which is now taking center stage in political discourse. Yes. Absolutely. We've been talking about exactly that, the cost of living uh, crisis, as many people see it. There's also something of an identity crisis, Andrew, here for many Conservatives, because there's lots of talk about whether the Tories can still claim to be the party of low taxation. Can Rishi Sunak really credibly say he is a low-tax Chancellor with the recent rises that he's announced? Well, you can't claim to be a low-tax Chancellor and preside over the biggest share of GDP that taxis now take uh, since Harold Wilson was in 10 Downing Street in the 1960s. Taxis are very high, they're about to get higher, and they could get higher after that. The Chancellor spoke, uh, it was a very political speech, so there was almost no economics in it of any importance whatsoever. He did say he favored fiscal conservatism. Uh, the whole did not react in huge support for that. It was quite muted because I think. They know that fiscal conservatism means tax rises. And what it hasn't dawned, I think, both in people at that conference, people watching us now, Joko, is just what's coming down the pike. Not just the national insurance contribution increase, which of course hits the lowest paid, but there are big income tax increases coming along because he stealthily froze the thresholds. That means people who didn't pay tax will now pay tax and people who paid 20% marginal rate, over a million of them, will soon be paying 40%. And then you've got the rise in uh, corporation tax, which is coming in in the next year or two. By 2024, on these three tax rises alone, the tax take will be £36 billion a year higher than it would have been. Adding £36 billion to taxes, is a strange definition of being a low tax chancellor. Andrew, there's been this sort of strange discourse here too at a Tory party conference where it looks as if the Prime Minister is taking on big business, business in general, when it comes to this issue of immigration. Is that wise? Well, I think the Tories, we're going through, we're, the 2019 election was a watershed in British politics. Uh, support for the Labour Party became more middle class, more professional, more white collar. Support for the Conservatives became more unskilled, more blue collar. And the Tories are. There is now a kind of blue Tory uh, move here. That The Tories are now more the party of working class voters. Uh, big business has gone rather woke, to use the uh, unfashionable term. Uh, the south of England, the richer parts are increasingly voting Labour. The Tories see for themselves the way of holding on to the red wall is to preside over big increases in wages and not to be seen to be in the pockets of big business. It's a political strategy. I think it, uh, it, it's probably the best hope they have of holding on to that red wall vote because come the election, there'll be precious few things they can point to which have made a material difference to the folks on the red wall. And so, therefore, they're going to have to position themselves politically in a way that will keep them popular with what were formerly Labour voters who actually like big spending, don't like big business, and are socially conservative. You add these three things together, that is the Tory strategy way of holding on to the red wall. And if that means upsetting the CBI, 
I think the Johnson government will say, so be it. Andrew, thank you very much. See you soon, I hope. You, me too. Nice to talk to you. Bye. Um, let's welcome Claire Coutinho, Tory MP, and also Private Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasury, and Annabel Denham, who is from the Institute of Economic Affairs. You heard some of that interview there with Andrew Neil. Rishi Sunak cannot claim to be a low-tax Chancellor when we have just seen him unveil the tax rises he has when it comes to national insurance, the freezing of income tax thresholds, and, of course, we know that corporation tax is going to rise. That mantle's gone. So I think, you know, we can claim to be the party of low tax. We, talk, we just heard from the Chancellor now his vision for prosperity for the country, which focuses on jobs and skills. And I think we have to recognise the situation that we've just been in, which is a global pandemic that no one expected. And it's in the wake of that that we've taken some difficult decisions. So we haven't shied away from those. We've been very honest and upfront about the fact that we've had to raise taxes in particular ways to help us recover. But if you look at the ambition of what the Conservatives are doing, what this Chancellor is doing, it's to increase jobs and put the skills in place that we have a growing economy going forward. Can you claim to be a low-tax Chancellor, Annabelle? Well, I'm not even sure that the Conservatives are trying to claim to be the party of low taxes anymore. I think they're trying to claim to be the party of lower taxes. Well, if you're comparing the Conservative Party to the Labour Party, then that's accurate. But what I would like to see is some of the fiscal hawkishness that our Chancellor claims to be uh, sub sub subscribed to, to actually be played out in some of the policy. At the moment, I'm not really seeing a vision for the post-COVID economy, and I think the government is really hiding behind uh, the pandemic um, and shying away from some of the difficult decisions that need to be made. Okay. Well, I would dispute that. I think if you look at some of the things that we're doing, whether it's investing in R&D, whether it's investing in skills for the young of this country, for the older generation as well, we've just seen new announcements today to help all people of this country get the skills in place. If you look at things like some of the investment opportunities we've created for businesses, like the super deduction, what we are putting in place is the building blocks of a prosperous country for the future, and that's how we are tackling growth. Right, the Prime Minister wouldn't rule out further tax rises. Would you have liked him to do so? Well, I'm, no MP can sit here and preempt fiscal policy. That's for the Chancellor to set out at future budgets and he will right. do that. So there, but, so there could be more tax rises But he was way. very clear today. He said, you know, I would like to in the future cut taxes. That's his ambition for the future. And that's why we are focusing on skills and on jobs so that we've got the economic growth to do that. Well, let's get some reaction to really what the Prime Minister has said. This was Jacob Rees-Mogg, leader of the House, at a fringe event on this issue of tax be looking to ensure the money spent by the state is spent efficiently, efficiently uh, and the tax burden is reasonable and we are at the upper reaches of the reasonableness of the tax burden. Why on earth would you think that higher rates in the 2020s will have a greater effect than it did in the 1960s and the 1970s? Therefore, I think we are at about the limit of what taxation can raise. So upper reaches of the tax burden. Um, do you agree with Jacob Rees-Mogg? Well, I think I agree with Jacob Rees-Mogg, and we all agree with Jacob Rees-Mogg, right. that we prefer lower taxes. Well, I think that's exactly what the No, he's what actually saying that today. actually the country's at the upper reaches of the tax burden. It's not sustainable. Is he right? Well, I, as you know, as I said today, the Chancellor set out as ambitious for a lower tax economy. But in order to do that, I think it is quite right that we've taken the steps that we have. And just looking at some of those things, if you look at the NICS increase, that is specifically designed to help with a problem that we have in the NHS, the election and the elective backlog that we've got and social care. So I think it is right that we're taking some of the difficult decisions to help with the challenges of the country. But of course, we are all ambitious to be a low tax country. What did you think when you heard a cabinet minister talking about the upper reaches of the tax burden? And I, I found myself nodding in agreement, Joe. We are at or close to the taxable limits of our economy. We've got the highest tax burden in 70 years since the post-war period and it's simply unsustainable. I mean, if you look at certain taxes, it's arguable now that we are actually on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, that by increasing taxes, we're going to see less money pouring into the Treasury coffers. Uh, so it, what we need is, is a bold agenda, and that simply isn't what we, we saw today. And instead, we've got a government that is applying more pressure on businesses at a time when we need the private sector to drive our economic recovery and drive growth. And yet we've got more employment regulation, we've got employers national 
insurance, we're hearing all of the wrong noises. I mean, the only defence that you can really offer is that the Chancellor, the government, cannot really claim to be low tax when, as you said at the start, it's freezing the personal allowance, which is a stealth increase in income tax. It's hiking corporation tax. But it's now increasing national insurance to supposedly pay for social care. But I think that that's yet more money that's going to be poured into our broken NHS. Well, I would say if you look at what's happening in the country at the moment, we've got one of the fastest growth in the G7. We've got one of the lowest unemployment rates in any major economy. We've got high business confidence. We've got high business amounts of the, the amount they want to invest. Mm. I would say that is a radical and positive position to be in. Annabelle? Well, I, you know, I simply disagree. And I think that if this government is truly committed to protecting jobs as it claims to be, then it has got to look at ways of deregulating, of unleashing employers and allowing them to create jobs and take on workers and start paying those workers more. And where what it's introducing is, is really going to do the opposite. You know, more workers' rights is going to make it more difficult for employers to, to hire people. And All right, I mean, that's Annabelle's view, but actually it's clearly on the minds of delegates here because a large number of the fringe events, I think over a dozen, are focused on the issue of low taxation. Are you having an identity crisis here? No, I don't think so at all. I think what we're doing is recovering from the pandemic and taking sensible and reasonable steps to do so. But I think it's quite right that the Conservatives are debating low taxation. It's quite right that we're talking about growth in the economy. That's what we're famous for. That's why people vote for us. And I think that's what we'll continue to try and do. Let's just show you uh, this BBC story. You will have heard it this morning. Uh, BBC News, Pandora Papers, Tory donor Mohammed Amersi involved in telecoms corruption scandal. Big questions about the sources of a major donor to the Conservative Party. What's your response, Claire? Well, I mean, I haven't read through the documents myself, but I do know that actually the steps that we started taking under George Osborne have made us one of the best countries in the world in terms of cracking well, down so how on did tax that happen, then? Uh, avoidance. And if you look at the independent organisation FATF, they do say that actually we're one of the best countries in the world. But what we need to do is see that international cooperation on some of the things that we've put in place in the past. But if there are major questions about a big donation to the Conservative Party, should that donation be given back? Well, look, I haven't seen those details, so I can't comment on that specific case, but I do think it's right that we crack down on tax evasion. If you look at the measures we've taken in the past, that's exactly what we have been doing here. I mean, there is a question, Annabelle. Different rules apply depending on how wealthy you are, and this seems to underline that. Certainly we've seen that throughout the coronavirus pandemic. We've seen those who are wealthy, those who are connected, be able to uh, find their way around the rules, to fly overseas when the rest of us are subject to traffic light systems. Uh, there have been countless stories of this over the course of the pandemic. The problem for the Conservative Party is that this is a scandal coming at the absolute worst time. Uh, you know, it's trying to regain uh, some credibility. It's All trying right. to reach out to the party faithful. Um, and, you know, it has introduced some good measures. I don't want to just be too down on the government. It's ended the uplift in universal credit. It's ended the furlough scheme. There are some symbols, signals of uh, fiscal prudence, but this is, as I say, coming at a very unfortunate time. Let me just show you these pictures on a totally different subject. The government, by the way, has confirmed a new target that by 2035 all our electricity will come from renewables. It was a story in The Times. This is all ahead of COP26, the big environmental conference next month. Meanwhile, Insulate Britain an offshoot of Extinction Rebellion. The climate change group have been staging a protest. You can see them here, some of the protesters being dragged off uh, the streets. It's from Talk Radio TV who filmed this. They're being dragged off Wandsworth Bridge. They're blocking it. What do you make of this? Well, look, I'm really passionate about protecting the environment, but I don't think disrupting people's normal lives is the way to do it. So I think it's quite right that we've increased the measures to make sure that we reduce the disruption from protests like that. Right, well, it's clearly not working. It's members of the public who are dragging these protesters off, not the police. Well, I've seen this happen a lot in my own area because I represent East Surrey, so we're very close to the M25, and I've seen a very good, I think, presence from the police also helping to sort this out as well, which is quite right. What would your message be to members of the public here? Um, well, I think we put the measures in place so that the police can step in. I can't see them in that image, but I'm sure that they, you know, they'll be able to help them in the way that they've helped my constituents, and I think that is quite right. Right, because there is an injunction in place, but there's a loophole that allowed them to block this particular road. So it's not working, is it, what the government's doing? Well, I know Pretty has put in lots of things in place, and I'm sure she'll continue to keep making sure that we can make progress. All right, Claire Coutinho, Annabelle Denham, thank you both for joining me here on the first day, the first full day, I should say, for us here in our studio in the auditorium. We'll be back Back tomorrow at Conservative Party Conference. Please join us and thank you for watching. Bye bye.